And uh, so we're going to continue on tonight, kind of the second half of our practitioner night here in, in urban affairs. Um, first, great to kind of hear from the, the city council side with, with Marshall and his perspective, and now more from kind of the community, community organizing side uh, of the enterprise. So in, in the second half here, we have uh, James Suazo. Uh, thank you so much for being here, James. I, I know you're uh, in demand and it's just so busy and just really, really appreciate you being here. Uh, so just so fortunate to have the speakers that we're having uh, tonight, just for them giving their, their precious time. And, and we're really grateful uh, for that. James, great to see you. James is the executive director uh, at Long Beach Forward. He's been there since, uh, since 20, 2021, like a little bit over a year. Maybe, kind of, maybe like January 2021, been kind of executive director, served as, as associate director for several years before that, you know, probably since 2017 or so. Um, works with Arts, uh, Arts Express as well, kind of program director at Arts Express and Pacific Symphony. Um, and so Long Beach Forward, kind of a well-established social justice organization here locally in Long Beach, uh, kind of focused on community development issues, racial and economic justice issues and and james uh is is leading that enterprise now uh as executive director uh so really excited to get james's uh thoughts and his perspective on what's going on in long beach you know um you know sort of um you know advances in multiracial coalition building and ways we can kind of work towards um stakeholder building coalition building proper and effective organizing uh within you know complex urban settings um Hey, James, and anytime you're ready, uh, you can take it away. And James has a presentation for us as well. So we'll, we'll do the presentation and then we'll save some time for Q&A. You know, we can go till the end of class at, at 945. And if we're done a little early, that's, that's totally fine as well. Hey, James. Sweet. Hey, Adam. Hey, man. Can you all hear me? Everything's good? Here. Here Beautiful. You. Okay. Um, well, great to see everyone. Thanks again for the invitation to come join y'all. I'm super excited. Uh, to be here virtually. A um, couple disclaimers really quickly. Today is like my first official day working back at our office here in downtown Long Beach. So I did not plan for this very kind of like weird lighting situation where I'm a little darker on, on camera. So my apologies, I'll work on the Hollywood lighting later. Um, but uh, also wanna make sure everything is good because my mouse disappeared as I shared my screen. So it looks like everything's up um, and we're good there. Cool, sweet. Awesome. Well, I'm super excited to be here and um, always appreciate when people Google ahead of, ahead of time. So I was like, oh yeah, those are some things that I do. So it's always exciting uh, to hear that a little bit. Um, but just as uh, your professor mentioned, my name is James Suazo. My pronouns are he and him. And uh, I like to describe myself as a reader, writer, organizer, abolitionist, art, artist, um, and to pay the bills, I am the executive director at Long Beach Forward. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about our organization. Um, so, um, and I think, you know, I opened that way just to share that all of these different kinds of identities and I think um, multitudes really inform uh, what I wanna share with you all tonight and what I want to, um, um, propose in terms of our work in terms of social change, in terms of co community organizing, but also um, all of this within the uh, context of uh, our urban communities and a lot of the work that y'all are studying um, and will be studying coming up. So um, I got to peek at the syllabus, which was like super awesome. And actually a lot of things that um, I definitely recommend to like interns all the time too. So I'm glad y'all are, y'all are well equipped to come intern with us anytime you want. So, um, I am gonna jump into it um, and a little bit about uh, my role as well for those of you. And, and just to also clarify too, um, so I've been at, with Long Beach Forward for the past seven and a half years. Um, my background is more in community organizing, um, started doing some electoral work and I've worked at Kelsey Long Beach. I'm also an alumni from Kelsey Long Beach as well. So go Sharks. Uh, my degree is in English education um, and did a lot of community organizing on campus as well. And um, so excited to be here. Always uh, love and have a soft spot coming back to Kelsey Long Beach. So um, as a little bit about my role as well as executive director, you can imagine all the different things that I do as a typical executive director from our operations and admin work um, to our working with our board of directors, our fundraising, strategic planning. Um, I think one uh, aspect, two aspects that are a little bit unique about my role that's actually written into the job description. One, our fundraising work at Long Beach Forward is really about um, mobilizing resources and thinking about how do we fundraise not just for our bottom line as Long Beach Forward, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, 
Um, but understanding that all the groups and that are organizing and doing work within Long Beach, they we are only successful if they are successful as well. So even looking at grassroots organizing and fundraising um, and using um, fundraising as a power a power building tool is really what's part of my literal job description. Um, and the other piece is community leadership. So exactly doing things just like this and going able to be talk about what's happening in Long Beach and the work that we're doing um, for movement building and social change is a real big part of my actual job. So I get to like say this is work time right now, which I think is really exciting. Um, I did open up the chat on my end too. So if you all want to engage in that as well, um, you're more than welcome. Um, I'm gonna share the slides with you at the end. There's a bit.ly link at the end that you can access this, including the videos that I'm gonna share. And then um, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So if y'all are ready, let's get into it. Um, so a little bit about organizing to win. This is what I, I kind of labeled this presentation. I'm going to revisit it in a couple slides just to talk a little bit more about um, our work in community organizing. Um, but before we do that, I want to start by sharing a little bit about Long Beach Forward. So if you haven't heard of our organization before, um, I encourage you to, to uh, Google our organization. You can visit our website and I'll have links to our social media later on as well towards the end. Uh, but our organization, um, our collective vision is that race and income don't determine someone's future in Long Beach, and that rather we can build a community where everyone is safe, connected, and healthy. So, of course, with that vision, right, there's an assumption, a leading assumption and value that we have that race and income actually do determine your future um, in the city and, and for a whole host of different uh, reasons, not just about uh, your different qualifying factors or identity, but also where you live. Um, in Long Beach, we have a um, nearly seven years of shaved off your life, depending on the zip code that you live in. And oftentimes zip codes uh, in central, west and north Long Beach, where you have much higher rates of disparities and larger inequities in comparison to other parts of the city, um, race and income play a huge factor in terms of your overall life expectancy. So we're not talking about just you know um, health uh, uh, chronic diseases. We're not talking just about asthma. We're not talking just about poverty, but this amalgamation of so many different things that all come back to race and income. So to that end, our mission as an organization is to create a healthy Long Beach with low income communities of color by building community knowledge, leadership and power. So in, in comparison to um, community nonprofits that you might know where you can come in and volunteer in a forest soup kitchen or provide direct aid and services, all of that is vitally important. I'm not here to dispel any of that, but our work is focused way more upstream and thinking about the root causes of some of these inequities and how we actually change systems for the better. And so a small swath, and I literally mean small, like it would take a whole nother 24 slides to talk about all the work that we have our hands in. Um, but just to think about, give you an idea about some of the issues that our team works on, um, that includes everything from city budgeting, civic engagement more broadly in the electoral arena, um, and just getting people registered to be part of the electorate, but also early childhood education, economic justice, immigrant rights, housing, and land use. And so there's a number of different efforts that we're involved in. Um, we've been around since 2010. We were part of a major initiative called Building Healthy Communities Long Beach. Um, we ha actually anchored that initiative here. Um, and we've since rebranded as Long Beach Forward to really cement our role here in Long Beach. Um, and we're a team of 24 staff um, who have been working um, continuously through the pandemic um, and have been pivoting to even do a lot of vaccine equity work. So we're still going um, and have no intention of stopping anytime soon, despite what people might want us to. So. Um, I often describe ourselves as the glue between a lot of different stakeholders, community members, uh, and decision makers and folks with inside systems and really being able to move the needle on social change as well. And so, you know, this as much as this work and is talking about what Long Beach Forward does in terms of our role, we're nothing without our partners and all of the other groups that we work with um, collaboratively towards these goals. And so I think I want to start there with um, what we wanted to talk about tonight and this idea of organizing to win. Um, and I'm going to start and talk a little bit about our theory of change and organizing, but also dive into coalition building, because I know that's something that y'all have been reading a lot about. And it's something I have a lot of um, a lot of stories to share, but I'm going to um, uh, focus in on a couple. Um, I want to start off with one video talking about, um, which I think is really apropos for this conversation, which is actually the first campaign that Long Beach Forward ever supported here in Long Beach, which was the downtown community plan. Um, some of you might be familiar with it um, in, uh, in shorthand, in Sparknotes version, because this video will talk briefly about it. 
the downtown plan was a, a city-led effort to rezone the entire downtown area um, back in, uh, started in about 2009, 2010. Um, and it really paved the way for, I think, a lot of what folks, when they're coming to Long Beach now, they think about these conversations around displacement, gentrification, um, luxury housing, all of that. And, and talking about the root cause um, comes back to the downtown plan. And so um, I wanted to start this also by and uh, showing this video, but also talking about the title of this presentation, which is Organizing to Win. Um, I want to be really clear that like part of our work and the, on all of the efforts that we take on, we organize to win. We know that we have a world to win. We know that the inequities that we're facing will not be solved tomorrow. They won't be solved in a year. And we know that it's long before our times that have even started here. And so we're working to change all of that. And so it's vitally important that we win. But also in saying that we organize to win, it means that we're going to lose. And I know that sounds weird. But I firmly believe that in order for us to win, we also have to lose at some point, right? And so I think that's part of this ongoing conversation that I want to start with you all tonight around um, struggle and social change and the progress that we make. And so um, without further ado, I'll show you this video and then we'll talk about it a little afterwards. Long Beach really did capitalize on the downturn. I remember discussions within the city and as the downtown plan was coming forward, yeah. they said, let's use this time to have a comprehensive conversation with everybody. Talk about when the market does come back, yeah. what does it look like and how can we take advantage of it so we're not falling behind. In 2012, we adopted our uh, downtown plan. It really was innovative at the time. We decided to look at the downtown rezoning completely from scratch. It's allowed us to fast track where a developer can come in and get approvals. Long Beach drew the largest line of urban renewal of any city in the entire country. They were desperate to bring people in. When the downtown plan was completed, that sort of signaled to the development community that we were clearly open for business. They wanted to get rid of rules to bring as many people in as possible, and it, that was a free for all, it still is. The downtown plan is certainly a byproduct of engaging the community yeah. and bringing everyone to the table. To your credit, Amy, when you say there's been zero variances since the downtown plan's been passed. Isn't it amazing? It's, it's, it's yeah. incredible. Yeah. I would love it's interesting because in Long Beach's uh, regional need is at market and above market housing. And so when you bring a project in like the current, that's actually helping us meet those obligations. After a lot of work trying to get people to move back to cities, of trying to invest in rail and mass transit, it's made cities more vibrant and interesting to live in. Coupled with an economy that values those kind of places and a younger demography that does as well, those are the main driving forces behind comeback cities. It's working. Big day in the history of Sacramento. I could not be more proud. Uh, I'm just glad I live long enough to see it. You have to balance the needs of development and the needs of renters who are much more vulnerable than uh, property owners. You have to find a balance. And in some cities, that balance is way off. If you look at Long Beach, it's a fantastic example of heavy investment downtown, along the waterfront, massive gleaming buildings, and you go three, four blocks away from that, and seeing that there is virtually no investment in those communities at all. When we were in our downtown plan campaign and we were highlighting all that the city was giving to developers, one of the council members at the time said something I'll never forget. She said, Long Beach is a cheap date and we need to stop being one. This appeal is about the Planning Commission's unwillingness to address critical issues important to the future of downtown Long Beach. The downtown market study said that there are 33,000 residents living in the downtown area. It said that 75% are low income. That is 24,000 folks who are at great risk of displacement. And that is the impact of gentrification. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, we'll take it behind the rail. Vice Mayor Lowenthal. If you can explain for me the likelihood of 24,000 or 1,000 or any number of individuals being displaced, I would appreciate it. It is certainly possible that people will be displaced. We don't deny that. But the plausibility of the displacement at that rate is, is uh, questionable at best. The lack of ownership in low-income communities of color is what's causing displacement. I mean, if you own something, you're not going to get displaced from it. So the downtown plan uh, was approved by the Long Beach City Council. Um, it was uh, our, our community-led campaign, which was a number of organizations, including Long Beach Forward, was really fighting to um, include affordable housing in the study and actually um, uh, require new development to come in and uh, basically inclusionary zoning, um, which we now have many years later after a lot of units have been built. Um, we lost the campaign. It included a number of other issues, in, including uh, local hiring, community benefits as well. Um, it was a campaign we lost, um, but I think, you know, it's important every time I meet somebody and we talk about uh, gentrification and displacement in Long Beach, I'm like, you have to know about the downtown plan, right? And I think I say that too, because it's important to understand the context at which all of these things build off of each other. Um, I also want to be clear that there's no silver bullet to the issue of gentrification, right? Uh, we do a lot of work around housing and affordable housing, renter protections, and so this issue is multifaceted, right? Um, but there are clear uh, campaigns, there are clear decisions that we can point to where we think about how these issues um, become exacerbated in many different ways. And so um, I could do a whole presentation on the downtown plan. I'm not gonna do that tonight because of time, but I wanna use that to then segue into um, a bit of our theory of change. Um, I think that sounded sexier than just saying some definitions and I don't have a fancy flow chart, but I do have a tree for you. So we'll get to that in the next slide. Um, but these are some of the terms and some of the, the components of our work that is really central to the work that we take on. Uh, and I'll be alluding back to the downtown plan and talking to some of our um, upcoming campaigns that we're gonna do a little case study on. But um, for us, organizing is just about transforming people just as much as we transform systems. And so I wanna really dig into that idea to think about what social change is because oftentimes, um, Organizing in uh, social change is really romanticized. And I think in this moment where, you know, we are going through a global pandemic, we've had this moment uh, with racial uprisings, um, there's been a huge resurgence of interest in realizing that what's happening now within our economy, within our country is not working for a lot of people. Um, and at the same time, right, as all of that is true, organizing takes a lot of work, right? Um, a lot of myself and a lot of other colleagues talk about how organizing is 95% follow-up, right? And there's so much that you don't see all the time. And so I also want to be clear about what we talk about when we say community organizing. What we're talking about is moving people from fear and alienation and into collective action towards a shared goal for social change. Right, so as central to this is we're talking about individuals who are directly impacted by these inequities, by these issues, by these problems, um, and oftentimes they're at the root cause of either racism, sexism, homophobia, capitalism, whatever ism there is that is causing this fear and alienation by design. Um, and moving people together, building relationships to move people together collectively, and again, towards that shared goal, right? Always easier said than done. But community organizing in itself is not just about pushing for change, but also transforming people and building agency and community empowerment in that same process. And to that, not all the time, part of our work is community building, but a large part of it is policy and systems change, right? When we think about some of this end goal, right? If we achieved our mission and our vision as Long Beach Forward, I would be out of a job and that would be fantastic. I, please help me be out of a job, right? Um, and so our work around policy and system change is about actually altering and transforming the policies, the practices, the power dynamics, the social norms, and the mindsets that shape all of these inequitable systems of power, money, and resources, right? So we're not just talking about laws, we're just talking about, we're talking about culture, talking about power, who makes decisions, right? How decisions are even made beyond just the individual people, right? But really actually looking at why are all of these inequities, why are these disparities happening in the first place? 
And central to all of this is leadership development. And again, you know, oftentimes what sets us apart from um, groups that do just advocacy work, you know, where we're, you know, we might know a solution. And so we want to go out and advocate for that and make that happen. Our work is about organizing and leadership development, which is about doing the activities and support that improves someone's skills, ability and confidence to actually be a leader, right? I think of so many of the community members that we work with where it would be great. Our goal is for them to not need us anymore, right? Because they know how to go and change. They know how to go and advocate. They know how to organize their own communities without us there, right? Um, there's a couple of folks who have been working and organizing with us for a long time and they're already at that level, right? They don't need us. They're like, where have you been? We, you know, you're late to the party. So, and that's great. That's the whole goal, right? So this is kind of the running threads that all of our work takes on. And so it's really important to understand. And so what I also wanna talk about is kind of this, I promised you a tree, so here's the tree. Um, this other piece about our theory of change when I think about community organizing and how this fits into the public policy arena. Um, I often use this tree of change as a, as a metaphor to talk about um, how community building, how social change is all structured and organized. So at the base of a tree, you know, uh, we have organizing conversations. These are the things you don't see. You don't always see the tree roots and how vast they run underneath it, right? But those roots are these organizing conversations for us. And these are intentional one-on-one -on -one conversations that build relationships with people one-on-one -on -one and agitate them into action or agitate them into understanding that something's wrong. Oftentimes, people who are really new to social change or organizing want to just like try and agitate anybody, but not everyone is ready to be agitated. Not everyone is ready to have that kind of conversation, right? But those organizing conversations create the base of the tree, which is the organizing relationships. Social change, organizing, all of this only happens when there are relationships. It is critical to everything. You're going to hear me come back to that when we talk about coalition building. Everything is about relationships. If you think about how certain decisions get made today from people who have power, it's also all back to relationships. I remember when I graduated out of Cal State, everybody was like, you got to network, right? Because it's all about relationships, right? There is no difference in any kind of arena like that. Because those relationships help move people into action. And it's relationships that actually make up organizations. And in this metaphor, we're talking about the trunk of this tree. It's organizations are the backbone of our movement that sustains all of, all of our visible work. So I often say, you know, if we want mass change, we actually need mass organizations. It doesn't happen with 5,000 individual agents, right? Because how are we gonna coordinate that? How do we actually move the needle on that? And all of that leads to what we see at the top of the tree, all of the leaves and the branches, art, music, protest, direct action, political education, canvassing, public meetings, our own media that we're creating. These are the leaves and flowers and all the visible external work in the world that builds our movement. So oftentimes, um, when we think about like organizing and social change, like I mentioned before, we see the external stuff. We think that's all it is. People just like go and are professional protesters, right? But there's no um, idea about the concept around what's at the trunk or the base or at the roots of the tree, right? And all of that work that goes into that. I also say that because oftentimes just in life um, and especially in social change, when I meet a lot of folks who are, are new to this, we think tactically. We think things are so effed up. Can I cuss here? I don't know if I can cuss here. Anyway, we think things are so bad. Okay, thank you. <laughs> we think things are so bad that we have to do something right now. We have to go block the freeway. We need to go, you know, have a mass protest, right? Um, and we can do that. Or is it going to get us anywhere, right? We're going to talk about that and revisit that because that's a huge um, component to that uh, and to social change. So I wanna talk a little bit about effective coalition building because I think this was a central tenant of what y'all have been talking about. And um, I wanna throw some ideas out there and think about this within the context of our work in the past, but also moving forward as well. Um, I originally wrote coalition building and then I was like, no, no, it has to be effective because there's a lot of coalitions, it may not be, be effective. So just talk, <laughs> I heard my coworker right now make a noise. So uh, I'm not alone in the office right now. Um, so let's talk a little bit about coalitions. So coalitions, you know, just to define it for us and have some shared definitions, we're talking about an organization of organizations coming together because of mutual self-interest to work towards a shared goal. And I want to underline that because I think sometimes we, you know, in social change, we think about everything's for the community, right? And it is. We're all doing this work to make the world a better place, improve the community, right? 
But we also have to recognize that all of us have our own self-interest and we can have mutual self-interest as well, right? We can work together to achieve and help each other each reach our goals. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the example that I wanna share with you all. But coalitions, when effective, they're based on that foundation of relationships, right? So if you think about the hard work that it takes to build coalitions, especially when they are um, across multiple identities, whether it's race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexuality, it takes some serious relationships. It does not mean that you will always agree. More often than not, you're going to piss each other off, right? But when you have a base of a, a, a foundation of relationships that are based on these ideas and values of respect, solidarity, mutuality, and support, that is what you do, what you use to recognize the shared goal. And I think there's also a recognition that each organization brings something to that table, right? And if we think about, you know, coalitions that have been able to achieve some really lofty um, changes in society, that's really important for us to understand. I'm not gonna get too much into this, but I also wanted to point out that um, my, my other colleague who does a lot of work with coalitions would be upset if I didn't include this, that there's also just a lot of different types of coalitions. Um, you have uh, multi-purpose coalitions that are long-term and focus on different issues or campaigns over time. You know, campaign being we have one objective and goal, we're gonna reach that, we're gonna achieve it, and then we're gonna move on to the next one, right? But this formation, this organization of organizations will continue working. Then you have campaign coalitions where it's short term, specifically one, one campaign. When we achieve that campaign, we call it a day in peace. And there's also electoral coalitions, right? So thinking about how we work directly on broader electoral strategy, I'm not exclusively talking about candidates, but also talking about any change that is created through the electoral system. So that also includes ballot measures as well. Um, and I think this also has implications for thinking about, especially in urban areas where you have um, a large ecosystem of not just 501c3 nonprofit organizations and tax exempt organizations, but 501c4 organizations, political organizations, um, thinking about labor unions, grassroots community groups. Um, it's important to think about some of those dynamics and we'll talk a little bit about that in the case study that I wanna offer you all. Okay, I know I'm going fast, but the coffee's kicking in and I wanna make sure that we have a lot of good time for a Q&A. So I, I thought it would be great to actually use um, one of our campaigns that I think is still always really timely as a great case study example to talk about coalition building and how we actually achieve social change. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Sanctuary Long Beach uh, campaign um, and coalition. So uh, what you see in front of you is um, our strategy chart. And so this is a tool that we use in all of our, a lot of our organizing. And when you think about major public actions or movements that you've seen either on the news or you've heard about in your community, there's a really strong chance that every single campaign of, like that had a chart like this, right? This is a chart that was adapted um, from the Midwest Academy. We've used it for a lot of our campaigns as well. Um, and this is how we organize to win. This is how we create the plan to think about how do we actually change the, um, the system and change the reasons why these inequities are existing in the first place. And so I'm gonna walk you through each of these and use Sanctuary Long Beach campaign as an example and talk about that. But um, as you can see from left to right, you have goals, organizational considerations, constituents, allies, and opponents, target, and tactics. Um, some of these kind of documents, you often don't see or hear about them publicly because they're very confidential and could really piss people off. Um, I've had some fun stories of, of um, efforts in City Hall accidentally sharing these and, and really upsetting a lot of people. So this isn't a tool just that um, organizers use um, for folks who are working within the public sphere as well. It could be a really powerful tool to think about how do we actually achieve change? Because even within our bureaucracies, right, we still have organizing work to do. Just because you get on the inside does not mean it just all happens magically overnight. Um, but I want you to think about this as like an Excel spreadsheet, right, with a bunch of formulas. When you mess with the formulas or you enter in different inputs in one column, it impacts the others, right? And so this is never one snapshot. And this is just a snapshot in time. It constantly changes. As our goals change, maybe our targets change. As our targets change, our tactics change. Everything impacts each other. And that's part of the strategic thinking when we think about this massive um, uh, charge in front of us of actually changing systems and policies, um, especially within a large ecosystem. So let's dig into it. So let's talk about goals, right? 
Um, I think we all heard of goals, right? And oh, actually, I want to go back and think one thing. Remember y'all earlier when I said that people often think tactically instead of strategically, right? We think we jump to the things that we visibly see. Think about how tactics here is number five on this chart, right? There's a lot of shit that has to happen before we even get to tactics. So um, I'll revisit that in a little bit. Okay, so goals. We're all familiar with goals. You probably have, I hope you have goals for your life um, and just for your own work. So um, kudos to you. We do the same in organizing, right? And in, in policy work. So when we talk about goals, we're talking about what we want to accomplish collectively in this campaign. Now for us, what's really important is also thinking about, and we know our work, especially in public policy, um, both within and outside of systems does not happen overnight. It does not happen um, in a month. Oftentimes it doesn't even happen in a year. This campaign is really rare in that things actually did change in a year, um, but that's because of the uh, landscape and the ecosystem. Um, but we know it takes time, right? And so for us, we often think about goals in terms of long-term, medium-term, and short-term, right? And so um, for us in the context of the Sanctuary Long Beach campaign, if you remember back in the day, um, uh, Trump had just gotten elected, and as soon as he was inaugurated, there was a huge um, rhetoric, there was an action around deportations, um, an effort to now not only just um, increase the deportations, but also really empower ICE as a rogue agency. And so for us in Long Beach, um, and Long Beach having a huge undocumented immigrant population, that was a huge issue. Um, and there was a huge outcry of people in the community saying we need to do something, right? Um, as many of you know, immigration is a federal issue. And so oftentimes, you know, we were told like, well, what can we do locally, right? And there is actually a lot that cities can do, municipalities, cities, counties, states can do to really curb and influence immigration policy. And so out of that, um, out of that increased fear of deportations and these efforts by ICE agents, community members that we had been organizing with who are already getting targeted by ICE, um, we decided to form the Sanctuary Long Beach Campaign, um, a, a group of organizations that I'll talk about in a little bit. And so we thought about goals. We had conversations with a lot of people um, in the community and organizations to think about what do we want to accomplish. Now, you know, obviously long term, we want to think about what's the bigger vision. We all wanted to abolish ICE, right? We also knew that wasn't going to happen in that climate with that president, in that um, in that kind of atmosphere at that time. But we knew what we wanted to push for, right? Whatever we win in this campaign is not the end goal. It is a, a, a rest point on the way to the final goal, right? Oftentimes, our median term goals are what we actually want to accomplish in this campaign. And for us, we wanted Long Beach to become a sanctuary city. We had a lot of rhetoric, we had a lot of uh, perspectives and, and conversation about how we're the international city, we're immigrant friendly, we're extremely progressive. And so we said, okay, let's become a sanctuary city. And in more practical terms, that means let's end police collaboration and all city collaboration with ICE. And so when we think about short term, these are all the wins that are steps to the above, right? Steps for us getting to our policy. And so we'll talk a little bit more about what those were. Once you have your goals, then we move on and think about our organizational considerations. So organizational considerations are the resources that we have at our disposal, how we wanna build our coalition or organization and all of the internal challenges, right? So this is very internal for us to think about, okay, before we go on this epic journey, what are the things we have and what are the things we need to know about um, uh, who's with us, who's at the table um, and what we're gonna to have to be prepared. So for us, you know, as a, a group of organizations that were coming to work on this issue, all of us at different points in our organizational histories or having relationships across the city, um, you know, there was, uh, it was clear that there was a, a lack of a strong immigrant justice and anti-deportation base of community members, right? There were people who absolutely were immigrants, people who cared about immigrant justice, but in terms of an organized base of people who are ready to be mobilized to an action, to city council, to all of those kinds of um, actions that would need to happen to make this policy move, we didn't have that. So there was a work to be done there. At the same time, we had strong organizing partners mixed with a lot of new groups. So if you remember um, this collective moment as Trump was uh, inaugurated, there was a huge resurgence of people who were realizing um, what was going on in the country and for one reason or another decided to take action. Always something that we welcome in the social change world, right? 
Um, and so there was a whole uh, a new host of organizations that were popping up and people who wanted to get involved and activated and actually organize against um, what was happening at the federal level. We also internally had a mix of formal 501c3 nonprofit organizations and grassroots groups, groups that didn't have any kind of like legal structure, but were a band of community members who were pissed off enough and wanted to do something about it, right? And so, you know, that's really important for us to understand about the ability to even help take on funds, to be able to resource the work that needs to happen, um, and to be able to legally protect us in some of this work, right? Especially when you go after opponents who really want to stop you, they will do anything to make sure that they can stop you, right? Especially for people who are, are um, opposed to your agenda and your vision. It's also important for us to also think in this stage about an equity lens, right? And when I say equity, I think about, you know, are there people who are most directly impacted by these issues at the table? Um, are we building the kind of coalition that is reflective of the community we want to have, right? And so it was really important to us that we be um, open to having a multi-ethnic and multiracial coalition as well. So we had Filipino groups, Latinx group, Cambodian groups, um, and uh, did our best to support bringing in uh, Black immigrant voices as well, although there wasn't a really strong base of Black immigrant organizers in Long Beach. We really leaned on people in LA, um, not too far away from us, right, who were leading a lot of this work and could really support um, building out that vision as well. And all of that, again, happens because of relationships, right? So speaking of relationships, that's how we think about our constituents, allies, and opponents. Now, mind you, I have not even talked about tactics yet, right? So just to keep that in mind. So when we think about social change and what it takes to actually move policy forward, when anytime, even if you're seated in city council, whether you're working within the system, you know, you always have to map out and think about who are the people that um, support you. Your constituents are the people that are with you. They're part of it. They're ride, ride or die. Allies are the people who maybe aren't at the table, but when you need them, they will be there, right? You can count on them for some kind of support in some way. Um, or when you make an ask of them. And then opponents, right? There will always be people who disagree with you. But what makes opponents different from people who just disagree with you is that opponents are people who are actively fighting your agenda, right? And so um, I'll talk a little bit about opponents, but overall, these are all the people who care and how they are organized, right? That's really key for us to understand about what do we need to do to actually move something forward. So for us, this isn't an exhaustive list of our constituents, but just to give you an idea about um, the, uh, the breadth and scope of what I talked about, you know, we had the Long Beach Immigrant Rights Coalition, Long Beach Forward, the LA Alliance for a New Economy, Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice, Khmer Girls in Action, Filipino Migrant Center, and the Democratic Socialists of America Long Beach Chapter. Um, and so, you know, I put that list up there to show and demonstrate the wide breadth of tendencies in terms of social change, but also not just in terms of um, organized base, but also faith leaders. Faith leaders played a huge part in moving sanctuary, um, the sanctuary campaign forward and actually bringing a moral and um, an ethical perspective to um, uh, this debate around what can we do to protect immigrants who are facing deportation. Um, and through this work, you know, partly because of the landscape and what was going on and so vitriolically at the, at the federal level, but also with this work, we had a lot of allies um, from local congregations, people who were organized and wanted to contribute in some way, um, but also local unions, right? Remember earlier when I talked about coalitions and mutual self-interest, right? Um, it's important to think about, even though we weren't talking about workplace policies, right? A lot of unions, especially Unite Here Local 11, which represents hospitality workers in the city, um, they have a huge uh, labor force, uh, many of whom are either undocumented themselves or have family members who are undocumented. And so this was a huge issue that was really important to the union as well. Um, and we were able to get support that way and have uh, labor, labor with us to flex that influence as well. And of course, other aligned community groups who said, this is a really important issue. We don't have the time to be at the table, but we will be out there when you need it. Um, and when I talk about opponents, um, usually when I talk about this, people are often um, really surprised that I don't say like Trump era racist. Um, and in reality, we didn't have those as opponents, right? And again, you know, were there people that were opposed to it? Yes, right? Online comments, but Facebook comments, 
Facebook comments at the end of the day are Facebook comments, right? But again, going back to my point about opponents, we're talking about people who are actively opposed and working towards uh, ending this agenda, right? And so for us, our biggest opponents were actually the Long Beach Police Department and the Long Beach Police Officers Association, uh, the POA union. Um, and their biggest opposition was in general, police departments don't like to be told what to do, um, especially by community groups or by um, having any other kind of legislation um, when it comes from the city council. And so there are a number of ways um, I'll talk about in the tactics that um, we were um, going to bat against the police department and the police union and fighting um, both in the public sphere and then behind closed doors in terms of moving this agenda forward. So lastly, I'm still not at tactics. Now we're at targets. So targets are the people or the person who can give us what we want and the person who has the power, right? So oftentimes we think about targets in terms of primary and secondary targets, right? At the end of the day, and I remind folks when we think about these large inequities, right? we think about housing, we think about gentrification, we think about all of these things that seem very intangible to us because they, they actually are. At the end of the day, all of those were based off decisions that were made by people, people who had power, right? The downtown plan, which fueled and set the stage for so much of the gentrification and displacement we're seeing today, it was a decision made by nine people on the Long Beach City Council, right? And so I really, part of organizing is being able to have open, honest conversations about power, who has it and who can change things, right? With that power. And so for us, if we wanted to make Long Beach a sanctuary city, we had to go to the Long Beach City Council, right? To pass this kind of policy to limit police and city collaboration with ICE. And so in Long Beach City, and you can do this in any kind of municipality, you think about how many council members there are. Um, in Long Beach, we have nine council members. And that means five is the magic number because five means you can make change. You don't need all nine. We're absolutely not gonna get all nine to agree to this. We just need five, right? And so our primary work was one, to make sure that we can count to five um, and also identify a council champion because somebody on the city council has to actually champion this, introduce it, make sure to get co-signers just like they would in any legislature. Um, and Lena Gonzalez eventually at the, end, at the end of the day was our champion who's now a state senator um, and she's moved on from the city council. Um, but it's important to point out that our secondary target um, was Mayor Robert Garcia. And while although the mayor has no formal vote on the city council other than veto power, um, he has to sign legislation once the city council approves it, he still has major influence. And so one of the earliest parts of this campaign when we first before we even had a fleshed out policy, before we really had done all of the community organizing, we wanted to, we needed to identify some folks in city hall who were supportive of it. Our first meeting was with the mayor and the mayor said, look, um, I'm not against you, but I'm also not with you. And I'd rather just let the state handle it than have Long Beach get involved, right? And so while he's told us that, you know, it's up to the city council and what they wanna do, we had city council members who would tell us I'm supportive of you, but the mayor doesn't want this to happen. So it's not going to happen, right? So I say that to also think about, does the mayor have power to give us exactly what we want? No, but influence is wildly important. And if we think about urban politics, we think about urban policy. This is exactly what we need to understand when we think about power and how it shapes all of these decisions, right? When it's the, the issue of what is right and what is something that we wanna do when think about who actually exercises power and yields influence in those decisions. So we knew that although the city council members were our primary targets, the mayor had to be on our radar because we needed him to be able to back down and let council introduce it and make sure that we could count to five. So lastly, finally, now we get to tactics, right? So tactics, what I mean, we're talking about what the constituents do to the target to meet the goals and build the organization. So hopefully that all makes sense because I just walk you through all of this Excel sheet, right? And I want you to think about those tree leaves that I showed you earlier, right? All of that visible stuff that we think about, all of this work has to go into all of these things that you see here, right? So, you know, oftentimes they get told, why don't we need to protest tomorrow, right? And it just doesn't happen that way. And so for us, you know, thinking about tactics, all of these tactics have to relay back to the target, to back to our goals, back to our resources that we have, right? So our campaign underwent um, months of door knocking in neighborhoods where there were large immigrant populations to talk about this policy, to gain their support, to sign petitions. 
Um, we partnered with um, uh, UCLA and UCI um, and their, their um, uh, student lawyers to actually draft proposed policy to even make it easier for our council champions to say, here's exactly what the city can do that's legal, that's within your right, and that we could actually do to protect immigrants. I hosted community forums to educate people about policy because part of organizing leadership development, like I mentioned before, is not telling people just, hey, here's a policy, let's go advocate for it. We want to build people's understanding of how things could actually be different, and especially for folks who may not have a formal education, may not understand complex immigration policy or why this is important and how vital it is that the city step up in this way. We also did formal legislative meetings with community members, so we would bring people who are directly impacted to talk to decision makers. And I will say, oftentimes, many decision makers say, I've never had these conversations with anyone, right? Um, especially folks who are directly impacted. Um, and when council members did not want to meet with us for one reason or another, we would be strategic about doing community delegations. Actually, the photo in here is one of my favorites because it's um, with a council member who didn't want to meet with us and ignored several meetings until we um, had a strategic delegation to her at a community forum and talked about the issue and had people who were directly impacted by their status, by the fear of being undocumented, talk about the importance of her being able to support this policy. And she ended up becoming the policy champion. So, you know, I think there's important, it's important to think about the different tactics and how we have to pivot, right? Something like that was not our, our first original um, plan to do something like that, but you have to be able to adapt and flex and think about the changing dynamics within the scenario. Um, and of course there's direct action, right? Being able to take this to the streets, being able to um, have a visible presence uh, and have rallies or turnout and public comment at points of decision, right? When I say points of decision, we're talking about city council meetings, committee meetings, where decisions are actually getting made and shaped in real time, right? In that public arena and atmosphere. And so with that, we won. We actually won this campaign. Um, a little bit about what we actually won. Um, our sanctuary city policy at the end of the day uh, was named the Long Beach Values Act. Um, what it does is limit city and police collaboration with ICE. It was not um, fully perfect of everything we wanted, but it was a really strong starting point for us to have a policy and practice on the books that would limit police collaboration. Um, and part of that um, effort um, at first was uh, meant to appease us, but we went for the whole thing was the Long Beach Justice Fund, which is a public fund that provides free legal representation to residents facing deportation. Um, this is a universal representation model that's part of a national project and, and other urban cities that are um, creating public funds to do the same exact thing. Um, when we think about due process in this country and, and folks who are facing different charges, um, it's not the same standard for folks who are facing deportation. Oftentimes, folks who are facing deportation can't afford legal representation. Families go into debt um, trying to have representation or individuals, even children, when children are facing deportation cases are left to um, defend themselves and possibly in complex immigration cases. So the Justice Fund has been in existence for the past couple of years now and has um, helped to represent a number of Long Beach residents who are, have been facing deportation um, and you can learn more about it and all the stats on the city website too. We also created a rapid response network that was a community-based model as an alternative to um, when ICE shows up and targets community members. Um, so there's an effort to train community members to respond, be rapid responders, even help post bail for community members as well. Um, and we created infrastructure for future organizing on anti-deportation efforts and police oversight. So, you know, this idea that even though this campaign may have been won, there's so much work that happens on the implementation end of moving it forward, right? There's, there's still meetings going on to this day around the Justice Fund, around some of the next steps, efforts to try and enhance and, and strengthen the Values Act. And so even though, you know, the, the landscape in which all of this was started um, has drastically changed, or maybe in some ways hasn't changed, um, the work still continues and it has built off and morphed off of that. And I think so many times in, um, especially in urban areas, when we think about how we address these social issues, um, they're never, uh, okay, we finished it and we're never gonna think about that again, right? I think back about the downtown plan and the efforts there of what happened um, so long ago, we're still dealing with those ramifications. We're still dealing with the impacts of housing, rent protections um, and the squeeze on public land as well. Um, 
So I'm running a little long. I knew I could I talk a lot. So I'm going to skip the next video because I do want to really have time for Q&A. And if we don't have time, if we end up having time, we can come back to it. It's like a 10 minute video. But, um, you know, I want to emphasize to you again, like I said, that all of these pieces play off of each other. And it's an it's an ongoing effort where it's cyclical. You know, when we finish a campaign, you know, we, we may debrief, we may think about some of the next steps, but we go back to that, we go back to that tree. We think about how do we continue expanding that base? How do we continue strengthening the tree? How do we continue growing the organization? Um, because these, these efforts evolve and change. And so, especially in urban areas, when power changes so often and changes hands so frequently too, right? Um, all of those things are shaped. And at the end of the day, um, all of these decisions, these environments, these um, um, social um, contracts are shaped by people in power. And so I want to go to Q&A because I, I, I didn't like talking for like 45 minutes. I would love to hear from you all. Um, but I also want to leave you with, um, you know, visit our website if you're interested in um, you know, I touched on a small a snippet of some of the work that we do. If you go to our website, you can find a lot of open source research um, and databases for a lot of um, uh, for a lot of uh, issues that I talked about or covered. Um, we try and make sure that everything's as accessible as possible, um, and encourage you to connect with us on social media as well on all of those platforms there. Um, and if you'd like copies of these slides, you can visit that Bitly right there, um, and that should pop up for you. So. <clears throat> Tremendous presentation, James. Really, really appreciate your insights. Um, and let, let's get into it. I think the students really want to have a, a back and forth. And um, I see Junie is the first one up with, with his hand up uh, over here. And feel free, you can engage in the chat box if you want, or, you know, just kind of raise your hand and we'll go from there. Go, go for it, uh, Junie. Uh, thank you, Dr. Butts. And, and James, uh, thank you for your presentation and being here for our class. Uh, some of the information and work that you're doing is, uh, is really impressive. Uh, but one of the questions that I have, uh, because obviously you touch on some issues that are very controversial, um, and I was wondering in your experience as you talk to a lot of community members, is the controversy more uh, media and social media driven, uh, some of the topics that you guys try to, to uh, resolve, or do you find that when the, you're involved with the community, they kind of support what you're trying to do? I know the media kind of blows things out of proportion, and I'm wondering what, what it is in your experience that you encounter. Yeah. Are there any um, issues that you're thinking of particularly? Um, no, I'm sure the um, sanctuary city was always is always controversial. Uh, I know that was a, a big deal, of course. Uh, defunding the police, I was just on your website, and yeah. just that phrase, defunding the police, is really controversial. And I know, of course, you're going to have opponents like you know Long Beach Police Department or any police department, you know, but... Uh, but those phrases kind of scare, intimidate people, and I think it gets blown out of proportion on social media and even in the media in general. So right. I'm wondering when you go out and talk to the public, is that the reaction, you know, that you're getting from them as well, too? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, to really get into that, I think there, there's a lot to be said for being clear about who our base is. Um, and the, the audience and community members that we work with, right? And so um, we're currently working on a project right now with um, a couple of the local hospitals on the community health needs assessment. And, you know, even though it's about what are the community health needs in the community, right? Oftentimes you might think of cardiovascular diseases, chronic illnesses, um, a lot of the data from people who are LGBTQ, um, older adults, Latinx, Cambodian that we had in focus groups that were just people that we reached out to through organizations, um, through people who interact with our social media, it's policing, it's housing, it's mental health, it's stigma, right? And so I think it's so multifaceted and I think oftentimes I think there is a role that the media plays, I mean, undeniably, right? There's a role that the media plays, I think, in shaping our perceptions and opinions about it. More often than not, from my own personal experience, when I talk to folks who might be of um, either more like middle class or um, more, uh, you know, maybe not uh, understanding the, the intimate uh, issues that are, um, that are in communities that are like have higher inequities or things like that, um, it feels really like you know div divisive or, or intimidating. Um, but you know it's on a regular basis that we work with individuals who have had personal experiences um, with the police or have had loved ones you know killed by police. Um, and so, or you know, even thinking about immigration um, cases, right? Um, 
we played a big role in the um, the detention center that happened a couple months ago. Um, not you know necessarily weren't in favor of it, um, but um, even helping um, uh, children who were released. Right. One of the things that wasn't lifted up in the media was thinking about you know what happens when children who are there age out. Right. There's no like hey let's help get you home. Right. They're given you know their their belongings and here's the door right and so you know there's a lot of work that we do that oftentimes doesn't get lifted up in the media for a lot of different reasons um, and I think the experience when you know you go talk to people in the neighborhoods or when we go door knocking it is really different from I think what I traditionally see in the media um, and those instances and you know it's I'll tell you I also we get a lot of cease and desist letters we get a lot of people who try different ways to intimidate us from advocating for these controversial positions we wouldn't do it if there were people who were really adamant that we push for these kinds of solutions and I think it also speaks um, to the time that we're in right when we're looking at the data today and thinking about people understanding you know this idea of a worker shortage when we're talking about a wage issue right that wages haven't kept up we have seven percent inflation. Um, there's, there's, you know, the social safety net as we used to know it is no longer here. Um, and there's not a huge effort to really revitalize that anytime soon. And so um, it is a very really different experience. And I always encourage and invite folks, if you ever want to join us, come to the doors and um, with us and, and as we do vaccine outreach um, in Central Western North Long Beach. And it's a very different kind of experience. And honestly, a lot of it is shaped by things like redlining, covenants, that have created these massive inequities that we see today. And I think that's also why people can live in one part of the city that is very different from Central Western North Long Beach and have a completely different understanding of what others are facing. So sure. I hope that answers your question a little bit. It, it does. Uh, thank you, James. I appreciate that. Thank, thanks, Judy. Great, great question. Great, great response, James. Thanks. Hey, hey Joel. Um, I see uh, Joel has his hand up. Uh, feel free, man. Go for it. All right. Um, thank you once again, uh, James, for the presentation. Uh, just from your perspective, uh, do you think city officials and let's say other residents um, that you service within your city, do you think they have a good grasp on what's happening current day, like present day, in terms of social equity issues and other problems that might be plaguing the city? And do you think they have a good grasp on like their own, like beyond their own perspective on what's happening around, around them and their environment? Um, great. Oh, I love these questions. Okay. So you asked about like people, elected officials and then community members, right? Yeah. 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 I think, you know, part of our work and I think my, my own, you know, experience of also growing up, I, I did not grow up in Long Beach. I grew up in Santa Ana, um, actually very similar kind of, um, neighborhood, um, to like central Long Beach area. Um, so, you know, my own personal lived experience of also growing up in areas where you don't walk around after 6 p.m., where you're lucky if your block has a sidewalk, where, you know, there are chronic gang issues and violence. Um, I understand, you know, when people are, are sharing their experiences and thinking about, and part of our organizing model is that people who are directly impacted also know the solutions, right? Um, so, you know, the first time we did our city budget campaign and talked to people about the city budget and said, did you know that we have our own city-run health department and that the health department gets less than 1% from the general fund, but the police department gets nearly 45% of the general fund, right? That didn't shock people in the neighborhoods we were working in. They were like, yeah, that absolutely makes sense. I am over-policed in this neighborhood and the health department is so far away. Um, our libraries are never open right? They have limited services and resources. So that's not a disconnect, right? It's people understanding their own environments. And then also being able to say, like, we understand why things are so bad. Um, I think on the flip side, though, you know, I think going back to relationships um, and thinking about elected officials, people in power, you know, I can genuinely say there have been instances where we've done work with either candidates or elected officials to educate them on these issues, because oftentimes, um, you know, elected officials don't typically come from the communities that are most impacted. Um, and so, you know, there isn't an intimate understanding of what it means to grow up in poverty, to have your entire, um, all of your decisions, your day-to-day -day decisions shaped by your class status or your income um, or your, um, your immigration status even, right? Um, one of the most successful campaigns we ever had that um, was successful in getting work done. We didn't win our policy, but it was a housing habitability campaign. Um, and what we did was we invited council members to go on tours of slum buildings. Um, I'll never forget one council member who's still on council. He agreed to come, walked into one room and we took him into the bathroom and he wouldn't even step foot in it because he said it was 
horrible. And it was all, you know, this tenant had filed multiple code violations, city never followed up on anything. The landlord, you know, never was, was uh, never held accountable for any of this. These were livable conditions, right? And so that was something where certainly he had no idea that this was even permissible and happening in the city, right? Um, but on the flip side, I also am not afraid to say that I think there are council members and people in power who understand these inequities and say that's also, that's just part of the system, right? And so I think, you know, one thing I didn't mention in my presentation, but I thought about in notes is that our part of our work is also understanding and getting to the core of values. You know, oftentimes we think about like um, folks in the conservative wing of, you know, like society and politics, um, you know, talk about values of like family and freedom and all those kinds of things. And so oftentimes folks on the more progressive side or when we want to see social change, we stay away from that kind of stuff. But in reality, when we talk about values and get to the core of these issues, that's how we win. That's how we move hearts and minds. And that's how we actually talk about what do we mean when we, when we talk about equity and public budgeting? Is it fair that we have everybody should have housing, right? Should everybody be able to have safe and affordable housing where they don't have mold every day, where they don't have infestations, right? And so if that's a core belief, then let's actually move that into action, right? So, I mean, based off, there's a council member, we talked about sanctuary um, today, tonight. Um, there was a council member we met with who said, I firmly believe certain people should be deported. So I'm not going to support this, right? And until we can get to that point and understand where people are, that's great. Because as I mentioned before, there's nine council members, we only need five, right? So whether somebody wants to agree with us or not, that just helps us move on to the next person, right? So I think there is, and I think that's part of the, um, the challenge. There are some people who may not know in power, but there are also people who choose to be, you know, not uh, acknowledge that or not want to actually change the system and the status quo for whatever reason, right? This council member that I, I mentioned, you know, was is a council member in um, East Long Beach, right? The, her constituents are extremely wealthy, well, some of the wealthiest in the city, um, much wider, um, actually are a lot of landlords, right? And so it is not in her interest to go after at some of these issues, at least from her perspective. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, Joel, great question. Some people need more educating than others, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what what else for uh, what else for for James? I see something uh, popping up here in, in the chat box from Felipe. Um, a lot of that's just blaming assumptions when when people oppose certain aid programs. Maybe yet, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I've heard this phrasing in the policy world: like people tend to be symbolically conservative but operationally liberal. Like they they want to support renter protections, they want to support you know, redistributive social welfare measures to the poor, but, you know, couching it maybe better within some kind of, you know, symbolic, you know, conservatism, maybe something, you know, hard, hard work, entrepreneurialism, and, you know, building up communities. Um, James, I was, I was curious around, <clears throat> when you're talking like policy strategy versus administrative strategy, like, like you get that policy change within, you know, city council, and you, it kind of looks like you had some strategies kind of engaging council members directly, engaging kind of the mayoral ship directly, when, when you want to shift more to the implementation side, are you, are you more apt to engage, you know, department heads, people on the administrative side of, of the, of the enterprise, um, and you kind of shift, you know, around from, uh, after the policy directives, you know, move more towards um, the implementation priority? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think, um, yes, 100%. I mean, one of the things that, um, I don't know if you all know this or not, but in Long Beach, not every city is like this. In Long Beach, we have a council um, manager uh, kind of structure. So we have a city manager who is the um, full-time position. He's the person who um, many of the city department heads actually report to, and the city manager reports to the city council. So even the city council members themselves have to go through the city manager to even work with certain departments or department heads. And so that poses a lot of interesting challenges because the person who is running the city really day-to-day -day is not even accountable to the people. Um, and so that's caused a lot of tension in the past. Um, our current city manager is someone who's not a big fan of um, community groups and advocates and organizers, right? Um, and I think it does pose some interesting uh, questions and challenges for the idea of governance. How do we structure um, local government in terms of you know, wanting to meet its um, efficacy and be efficient, but also this idea of, uh, of you know, how is government accountable to the people and, right, and what does accountability look like as well? Um, so absolutely, especially for instance, with the Justice Fund, you know, that gets 
once policy gets passed, it gets usually, you know, sent to, okay, Mr. City Manager, figure out where to live this in the city and how we're going to implement this. And there has to be a lot of work, right? Oftentimes, um, it's really important for us to really build relationships and allies with people within City Hall, um, city staff, who really are the day-to-day -day folks moving this forward. And that is a lot of the work, too, in helping uh, build those relationships um, and implement these uh, programs in the spirit of what the community wanted, right? And so, you know, for our organization also just to be, you know, like aware about it or, or just upfront about it, we're pro-government, right? We think there's a lot of ways that, um, you know, the government has an obligation to these ideas of, of equity. Um, and actually one of the campaigns I did not touch upon that came out of our loss in the downtown plan um, and engaging so many people at a city council meetings, we realized the city has no mechanism no platform for actually allowing residents who speak Spanish, Khmer, Tagalog, basically any language other than English to actually make those meetings accessible. And so we started um, an effort and looked at other major cities like Oakland and San Francisco that had language access policies that basically said, we have to provide city services and programs in languages other than English if we have large enough uh, monolingual non-English speakers in the, in the res residents in the city. And so after many years, after a lot of funding fights, we have a language access program in the city of Long Beach that provides um, services and translation in Spanish, Khmer and Tagalog. Um, Khmer for the K Cambodian community, Tagalog for the Filipino community. Um, but that to this day is a lot of work with city staff because none of us are trying to be certified interpreters. And it's a lot of work to authentically translate even one single document or a, a complex city council meeting in an entirely different language. Fascinating, yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, anybody else have a question here? We're, it's getting late; they're getting tired. I'm just going to keep plowing forward. How do you, I'm just I'm just intro. We, we did a series of readings around the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, it's kind of the, the latest kind of galvanizing racial justice movement, uh, kind of on, on the urban horizon and, and elsewhere. How, how do you view that as sort of like? A potential force for for galvanizing. We kind of you would say broadly. I'm taking this from your website. Communities of color. You know, yeah. how, how do you view that as kind of? You know, because there's this tension in urban politics to, to racialize or deracialize. You know, because I do, you know, is, is by saying that phrase, you know, Black Lives Matter, is that some of the readings said there's a bit of a perception amongst Latinx communities, Asian communities, of kind of, of kind of a zero sum game that might be played, kind of a perception that you have to get over around zero sum. And and um, just how do you view the Black Lives Matter movement, maybe in a place like Los Angeles Metro, where maybe Black individuals tend to be more of a minority force than, than others, and, and around kind of, you know, multiracial coalition building. Is, is it about finding that mutuality across racial groups, kind of what you were saying earlier, you know, around criminal justice concerns, economic justice concerns? Um, just really interested to see how you, how you view the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, as succinctly as possible, I think there's, um, you know, I mean, I know there's courses on, you know, uh, identity politics, racial identity politics, and all of those things. And I think it's really important to understand that, you know, just because we have, while representation is important, as somebody who identifies as, you know, um, Indigenous, Latinx, queer, um, representation is important, but it is not solely the thing. Unless we have an analysis and understanding of class, gender, sexuality, race, income, all of those different things, you know, we're not going to move the needle on some of these larger systemic inequities that we're talking about. And I think, you know, in that same vein of talking about Black Lives Matter, it's a movement that we absolutely support. Um, and it also means that we're not just talking about white supremacy, but we're also talking about anti-Blackness. Um, one of the most difficult aspects of our work is building multiracial um, and ethnic, um, multi-ethnic coalitions, right? Because thinking about the, the trauma, the generational trauma and um, the efforts that our communities, um, oftentimes whether it's Black community, Cambodian community, Latinx community, have often been pitted against each other. You know, I've absolutely run in and experienced anti-Blackness from Latinx folks, um, you know, from Cambodian folks, you know, um, and, and it's happened in so many different ways that there's a lot of work to be done even across these different um, divides. And so part of our work is really not just in terms of narrative, but also building shared identity and relationships across those racial differences, right? And being able to really lead with that at the forefront. 
um, and not shy away from saying that Black lives matter, right? And being able to acknowledge when there are um, efforts that are anti-Black in the community, there are absolutely groups, right? Who, you know, will, will share the, you know, but Latino lives matter too, right? Or that kind of expert. And we talk about engaging conversation. If you think about the tree I showed y'all earlier, right? The, the, the branches and everything. Part of that work is not just building off those one-on-one -on -one relationships. So people feel comfortable to have political education conversations, to have conversations that shift our consciousness and understanding about how we relate to one another, right? Because there's often a phrase where we talk about, you know, when, when you look at understanding equity and, and um, inequities, um, that Black folks are the most disproportionately impacted, right? And when you look at a whole host of different things, you infant mortality rates is something we talk about a lot about, especially among Black women um, um, and, and those disproportionate um, disparities. It's, it's, it's unanimous across the board, right? But until we understand that if we can improve conditions for, um, our, for Black communities in our, in our city, in our region, um, then, then we'll move the needle on all these other different areas. So I think there is a big part of being able to uh, help build that shared understanding, that mutuality, like you mentioned, but it also doesn't happen in a tweet. Like, I'll be really real with you all, right? It doesn't happen on the nightly news. It happens in one-on-one -on -one conversations. And oftentimes when I give presentations like this, everyone's like, okay, so what can we do? Literally the single most important thing that you can do is have conversations with your friends, your family, other people in your class within your social sphere to talk about these issues and build that understanding. And I think especially we're in a moment now where we've been you know, um, safer at home and or whatever, right? And distance and in and, and this way, or I think we're losing some of that, you know, and, and rightfully so, it's hard. It's hard to be patient. It's hard to have that understanding, but that's how we move it. We don't move things just in mass protests. Oftentimes mass protests pisses a bunch of people off, right? Like, let's be real, right? People are like, why are you inconveniencing my day, right? We are so ingrained in the day-to-day -day kind of thing. And so those one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one conversations and how we move those relationships, that is how we move the needle, right? Until we can have a conversation and interrupt anti-Blackness to talk about white supremacy, to talk about Black Lives Matter, to talk about how that shows up in our own lives, my life included, that's how we often move the needle, right? Thanks, James. R really, really appreciate those thoughts. Thanks. Uh, it's been a burning question for, for all of us in here. Um, it was kind of, it's kind of the most salient, you know, kind of social movement, you know, that we're kind of seeing on the, um, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, Felipe, I appreciate your comment. Thanks for that. Well, we're, we're heading down the home stretch. I just thought, you know, could you maybe say a, a few words? Th these are some, you know, really bright, talented MPA students, you know, if they want to get involved, um, you know, is, is the best way maybe to, to volunteer, you think, maybe for an organization like yourself, like Libre, maybe some some other uh, a community action partnership, you know, and you know, the kind of volunteerism, get, get out there, you know, get your hands dirty with an organization and then, you know, make your move, you know, from, yeah. from there. Is that yeah, absolutely. Um, I really encourage you all to check out our website if you haven't yet or follow us on social media. We'll post a lot of opportunities coming up. I know in the next coming months, we'll be doing our annual People State of the City event. Um, which will be a really great opportunity to learn more. Um, but I really encourage you all to figure out, you know, think about an issue that you really want to dive into. Uh, we need folks, you know, on the policy end to really understand a lot of these intimate issues um, or you're not afraid. And I always, you know, whether you want to do research, whether you want to do policy, I think until you get the experience of like walking neighborhoods or doing door knocking and having those hard one-on-one -on -one conversations, that's where you really cut your teeth. And I think more people, um, we really benefit. My job now is mostly a lot of paperwork and this kind of stuff. But when I get a chance to be on doors and have those conversations, it really grounds you um, and really gives you context to all of that. So um, feel free to, uh, I didn't put my email in there, but I'll drop my email in the chat as well. Um, I'm a resource to you all, so feel free to connect with me um, as well and would love to support y'all in your journeys um, and help make our world a better place. Outstanding. Thanks, James. Really appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate your presentation. You gave us that context around the downtown, but we, we've been fairly critical of Mayor Garcia uh, here. You know, around kind of we've been speaking about kind of de development regimes versus sort of more what's called kind of progressive regimes or kind of working class regimes. And, and you know, it's a real conflict in, in the city of Long Beach now, kind of around priorities. And I see kind of more of the origin uh, of, of that bit now. You know, it's kind of the development side versus others. And and like, like, like they said in the video, you know, ultimately we rested on, it's about finding that balance. You know, it's, you know can, can you find that balance and, and look out for, you know, for working class interests alongside development issues as, as well. Uh, it's a tough act. You know, it's a tough balancing act. Yeah. Um, thanks, James.
really appreciate it. Uh, can, we, can we all give James a virtual uh, round of applause? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, James. Your, your insights are, are so valuable. And uh, I think everybody has taken so much away from this. I will make the slides available. Uh, James is available. Um, and we'll all be uh, helping to volunteer and move the city forward uh, from here. Thanks, James. R really appreciate